uh, an efficient Go package. And I'm going to use, for my example, building a JSON parser. Before we get started, let's talk about some of the goals of the project. Like, what are the things that we want to get to when we're done? The most important one, um, because in the, the pantheon of alternate JSON parsers I found, is not all of them support streaming operations. In fact, the ones that claim that are fast don't support it at all. And streaming is really important because it's unrealistic to assume that we can just have all of the output in memory. Um, if we're going to buffer that memory before we process it, that means that the amount of memory that an attacker could use is controlled by them. They control how much they're going to send to you. Um, and buffering is also, uh, it in introduces latency because while you're waiting and reading and collecting data, you're not processing it. So one of the key things we want to be able to do is to stream, support streaming. The second one is we want to be reasonably compatible with the encoding, encoding JSON parser. We want to support the same high-level JSON decode API. And possibly also we want to offer an alternative that has lower allocations and maybe uh, more efficient. So let's dig into that a bit more. We all know and love JSON. It's a hard format to parse because it doesn't have length markers. To know how much JSON uh, to read, we have to read it all. If we want to get the 1,000th element from an array, we have to read the 999 that come before it. And so that means that the lower bounds on how long this is going to take is how long it takes to read the input. But reading isn't, isn't the whole story. We also have to parse it. And so we need to run it through the JSON state machine. We need to figure out what the tokens are. And so that means the performance of this, this package will be read of the bytes plus process of the bytes. But it gets a little more complicated. Because if we read each byte, we want to make sure we read them only once. We want to read that byte. We never want to touch it again. Because if we do read it again, well, we're just wasting time. That's overhead. And if we need to read bytes more than once as they come streaming in, then we need to keep them somewhere. And that means we have to have a place to keep them and pay the cost of doing that. Similarly to we don't want to process a byte more than once, we don't want to process a token more than once for exactly the same reasons. We want to limit the number of function calls that we use to do this because if they're usually going to be a function of the number of bytes or the number of tokens that we have. To Kirill's point, we want to limit copying. We want to have a design that limits the number of times we copy because copying is just revisiting a byte. And whenever we're copying data, we're not processing it. It's just overhead. And lastly, we want to pay attention to allocations, as we've just heard. Um, if we limit the number of times we copy data, then we limit the number of times we have to make an allocation, because if you're copying something, you need a place to put it in. So if we have less copies, we have less allocations. And overall, if we have less allocations, then we put less pressure on the shared resource, which is the heap. I mean, the heap is, there's one heap per Go process, and it's interacted with by all the Go routines in your process. And so if you're working inside the heap, you're competing with other, other processes there. That means locks, cache contention, all that good stuff we want to avoid. And obviously, the fewer allocations we make, the fewer we have to free, the less time spent doing garbage collection is the more time available to doing processing. We saw Kirill's example earlier that the GC for one allocation was 30% of the CPU time. At the high level, when we're decoding JSON, we usually work in two, two, at two levels. We have a scanner or a tokenizer that's going to read that stream of bytes and turn it into a stream of JSON tokens. And then on top of that, we'll have something called an unmarshaller, which is going to read that stream of tokens and apply them one at a time to a Go object. What then is a token? Well, as we all know and love, because we're all programmers here in this room, we know, we know what this JSON looks like. But just to break it down, if this is a stream of bytes, 
we have the opening curly, which signifies that what follows is a collection of key value pairs. We have the string A, we have a colon, we have the number one, we have a comma, another string, a colon, true, which is not the string true, it's the actual Boolean true, a comma, another string, a colon. We have the square brace, which indicates that we're now in an array, and so inside the array we have the number one, a comma, a string, which is two, another comma, a null, and we close the array, we close the, the brace. We want to write some Go code to process this, pretty straightforward. We have our input, wrap it in a strings reader because json.newcoder takes a string, uh, a byte slice or a byte reader. And then we just call decoder.token over and over again until we hit an error because we've run off the end of our input. We run that, we get something like this, which is exactly what I just went through. The curly, the A, the one, the B, the true, the C. And there's a, a nice convenient thing that encoding JSON does for us. You can see that these aren't just, they're actually typed. So the A is a string, and the number, the one is a float, and the, and the true is an actual Go Boolean, not just a T or a, a, a string true. So this is all really convenient. And the way this works is that the type of the value returned from token is the empty interface. So it can contain both the value of the thing and the type of the thing. But we don't get this for free. Um, Brad Fitzpatrick once perhaps saltily called the token API a garbage factory. And to understand why he would say something like that, we have to look at the, the design of this API and see how it forces allocations on us. You can write a little benchmark here. This is possibly the simplest JSON parsing. A string is valid JSON. It's just one token. And so we have a benchmark where we're just going to try and parse that token over and over and over again, resetting the input, parsing again, resetting the input. Don't get too worried about the speed or the time taken. This is just on a random machine. What I do want you to focus on are the third and fourth, the allocations. To parse that seven byte string, hello, that was 37 bytes allocated, and it did it in three allocations. So to drive home my point, API design influences allocations. Allocations can influence performance. I know Kira will probably say they do influence performance, but it's very much contextual. Like, if this is in some startup code, not really important. If this is in the, the central of your trading engine, yes, you do care about you do care about those allocations. And if you want to button hold me at lunch and ask me why it's three, I'd be love, I'd be happy to explain. So let's go back to the problem. We have this sequence of tokens. I've written it out a bunch of times. I've just broken it out, um, broken it up for you. And if you look closely, you'll see that the first character in each token gives you a hint as to what kind of token it is. The curlies and the squares are collection start and end. The T, a T never appears in JSON. If it appears as the first character, it is the, it is the, the token true. It is not the string true, because strings always start with a quote. Same for false, same for n for null. Same for the numerals. So this is an improvement we could make. Rather than returning, uh, as encoding JSON does, a typed interface, we can just return uh, a, a byte slice, a subslice of the input. And the first token of that slice will tell us what the type of the token is. So this is introducing the um, GitHub package JSON. You can see we have exactly the same API as the uh, encoding JSON. It's, it's called next token. But it's the same thing. You have some input, pass it to JSON decoder, you call next token until you run off the end. And 
we get the same output. Well, nearly the same output. You can see there that the values are no longer typed. They're actually just byte slices, and I'm just printing them as strings. And so it's a similar API, but it does come with a few, uh, a few caveats. And the first one is that because the output that I'm printing here is a subslice of the input, there are restrictions on how long that byte slice is valid for. Um, if you use the buffio scanner API, where you iterate over uh, um, bytes, bytes read, you're only allowed to use inside, you're only allowed to lose, use that data inside the context of the next. And once you call next again, it's no longer valid. It's a restriction, but it turns out it's not a particularly big restriction. And of course, the other one is that we lose the type nature of the tokens. But we can get that back with, by building abstraction on top of, on top of this, uh, this new API. Now, I want to take a little sidebar and talk just about reading data. Like I've said the word reading data a bunch of times, but let's actually look at um, other efficiencies or inefficiencies in that. As I said before, JSON isn't length delimited. So to find the end of the token, we have to read all the characters until we find the end of the token. There's no, there's no way to skip ahead. Now, we're all Go programmers. We know that if we want to read data from some input, we have an IO reader. We make a buffer, we pass that buffer into the IO reader, and it will tell us how many bytes it copied, it copied into our buffer. Perhaps I shouldn't have called them problems. Maybe I should have just said there, um, there are some areas we can improve. I a reader reader copies, and this is, I, I made this, I underlined this because it copies the data from its internal store into the buffer you pass into it. That copying takes time. When you're copying, you're not processing. But there's a more um, kind of pernicious problem, which is it makes the buffer management the problem of the caller. Above, I had a 4K, 4K buffer, and that was really a guess. Like, I hope that that's enough to read enough of the input for the things that I care about. Now, what we could do is, if that was a problem, we could read one byte at a time. Call I read a read, pass in an array of one, get back one byte at a time, and look through them and build up the token that way. But then that makes it our problem to, as we're building up the tokens and find, okay, this is looking good, we have to put it somewhere. We have to allocate storage to keep this, to keep it, to keep it. And uh, occasionally we might need to put it back. There are some times when you need to backtrack from the data you've read. The more reasonable one is to create a larger buffer and then read into that, into that buffer and then look inside the buffer for the start and the end of your token. And 90% of the time you'll be okay, except for when you didn't quite read enough. And so you have the start of the token, but not the end. Say it's a long string, and you have the start of the string, but you don't have the end. And that leaves you with the problem that now you need to go and make another buffer, do another read, stick them together, then do your search again. Hopefully you read enough. And then you, you, you kind of see that this is a kind of, um, it's a tricky problem to manage this. Um, and fundamentally, it's not efficient even if you do. So the, the idea that I want to introduce you to um, is inspired by a, a D package called IOPipe. Um, Philip Pearl also wrote about this. I'm, and I'm going to call this type, just for this argument, byte reader. Now, a byte reader operates similarly to a buffer reader. It is a buffered reader, but it has a more efficient API. It only has three, three methods. Fundamental is this method of a window, where you can say, you can ask the byte reader, give me back a byte slice which represents the current window that you see. We can ask it to release bytes from the start of the window, and we can ask it to extend to the end. So if you imagine this stage being an infinitely long stream of input, we start with a window, we can grow it and release, 
grow and release and kind of move crab-like along through the input without ever having to read the whole thing into memory and always being able to just ask the, the byte reader, give me back a slice which represents what you can see right now. Let's make this a bit more com uh, concrete and show you how to use it. One of, the, one of the other things about parsing JSON is that it's a mixture of tokens and white space. Space, tab, new line, carriage return, they can occur anywhere inside the JSON, but semantically they're ignored by the parser. So if you think about it, the search for the token begins with finding the first character that is not white space. So let's do an example of that. I have a function here which takes a byte reader. We're going to initialize a counter of the number of white space characters that we find. We initialize W with the current, what the reader can see currently in its window. And then we can just range over that because it's just a byte slice. And for each character, test if it is white space, increment our counter, and go around that loop. No, nothing, nothing surprising there. When we uh, get to the end, because we run off the end of the range, we then say to the byte, uh, the byte reader, release. So release all the data that you've read and make it available uh, for futures. And then we can call the extend method, which tries to read more from the underlying source and refill itself. Uh, there's a special case where extend uh, uh, returns no, but returns zero, which is to say, I've run off the end of the input, so end of file. Otherwise, we re reinitialize w w with the new byte slice, the new view that the window, the window of the byte reader has, and we just go around again. So this does the minimum. It visits each character one time and makes a test. And I argue that any useful JSON decoder can't go faster than this in code written in Go. Maybe if you're going to use I've seen some examples using vector instructions to parse JSON. But in our world, where we're writing in Go, this is as fast as you can go. You can't visit the characters zero times, so one is the lowest you can go. On the machine that I ran this on, there's a bunch of different test files there. We get around two gig a second. So that's how long it takes just to read through the file. Can't go any faster than that. And that gives us a good baseline. If you want to buttonhole me afterwards and talk about different ways of doing that white space test. Um, that's a lovely sidebar we don't have time to go into now. But now we, can, now we can move up a step and we can build on top of our reader a, a scanner, a thing which is going to run the state machine of reading each of, the, each of the characters and finding the token start and end. And scanner.next, um, again, it's inspired by the Buffio scanner uh, package. You have this iterator model. You keep calling next until you run out of input. First thing we do, we're going to clean up from the last time we were called. So we're going to release any data that was uh, previously read and just set our offset back to zero. Offset is basically how far into the window, uh, the, the, the underlying window of input we are. And always, once we've read a token, we're going to cut. We're going to cut off and, and align that to the edge of the window. We call a, a token function, which is going to read any white space that uh, read any white space that might be in the file. You can imagine if something was nicely indented, then you might have hit a carriage return and then a, a bunch of tabs and white spaces, and it's going to align us to the next, the start of the next JSON token. For convenience. Um, we actually return that token because don't forget the first character in the token tells you what type it is. And then just switch on that type to do the various logic depending on what kind of token it is. If it's a, you know, a colon, a comma, an array start and end, they're pretty simple. If it's one of the predefined identifiers, true, false, nil, we can handle those. We handle strings by uh, looking, uh, handling escaping and looking for the closing quote and numbers, numbers in the same way. Oops. 
And fundamentally, at the end of this process, we've got a length value which tells us how, uh, what, what, how far into the token, how far into the input does the token extend, and so we can just do a subslice. So let's dig a little bit further into finding the token, which we just kind of saw before in the count white space example, but it's now inverted, because what we're looking for is the first character that isn't white space. So we start with the window, we range over the contents of the window. If it is a white space, we increment that offset a little bit, just to mask it out. Then when we find the first character that is in white space, we release all the ones that we read up to, so we know that uh, from zero to the offset is white space. We can just discard that now. Otherwise, we extend, and if we, uh, if we extend, we then reinitialize the window and go around again. Let me go, let me just put the code back on there to show you. So there's a few things to note here. There's no error handling in this file. We're reading from an IO reader. There's no error handling here. It's not that there isn't error handling. It's just not, ne it's just been nicely abstracted away because of the way the byte reader works. For every, every character in the range, so for every C in W, we don't need to like check, did we get a C or was it an IOEOF? Because if we, we just process in the data in the window. If the window is exhausted, then we're just going to exit out. The extending, the actual grubby bits of reading from the underlying reader and managing buffers and dealing with the fact that a token might have started in one and you may need to read more and stitch it on the end, is all handled with this extend method. You don't have that logic sprayed through this, this token function. And because of that, the performance of this is really dependent on the size of uh, the byte reader that we start with. The, it has an internal buffer, and we can adjust that buffer to basically trade off how many times are we going to call extend versus how many times will we have the data in the window. And it turns out that a buffer of 4K, 8K is more than sufficient. So let's talk about how this performs. So this is doing a higher level on top. We're not simply just reading characters one after a time. We're actually breaking them up into tokens. And if you recall back, the white space example was around about two gig a second. So if you look at the same inputs tokenized, apologize for that, we are between a quarter to two fifths of what we consider to be our two gig baseline. So maybe we can do better. The first improvement um, is we spend a lot of time maintaining this offset value, which is how far into the window does the token start. Uh, we can observe that the offset is always zero just before we call the token function. We just re the, the first two lines of it are setting, uh, getting the window and releasing, releasing the window and setting the offset to zero. So we know that it's always zero on entry. And if we look back to the function, we also set it to zero on exit. Because again, we've just released, released the data. So we can rewrite the function to make offset local, rather than reusing that field in uh, the scanner struct. This is the, this is the same code, just offset is being tracked locally because, because we always set it to zero on exit, and we know that it's zero on entry, the caller can't tell that we were using it temporarily a scratch space. Let's just look at the, the impact of this, uh, this change. It's strange because it's not uniform across all of the inputs, and we'll come to that in a little bit. But you can see that this one check of not having to write that offset value back to the field every time and back to memory um, had a substantial improvement. In, in some cases, but not all. 
And, one, and probably the main reason for that is that different inputs in the test set have different, amount, different amounts of white space. For example, the Canada benchmark, the one that basically showed no difference, uh, only has 33 white space characters in the whole input. Whereas CETAM, the one below it, which was nearly 40% faster, um, has, ne has over a million white space characters in it. Um, and again, I don't think we have time for questions after this, but you're welcome to buttonhole me and ask, well, shouldn't the compiler optimize that away? Because I think I have an answer for why it can't. Now, there's a larger improvement we can make to this code um, r related to inlining, which is, as Kirill, as Kirill showed, it is the ability of the compiler to take the function from uh, lower down and bring it up to bring it in line with the calling code. The benefit of this is that it saves us a function call. The Go compiler obviously supports inlining. In fact, it's on its third rewrite, I think now. I think 1.22 will have a new, a new version of the inliner. But it, each, each inliner has limitations. Kirill showed some of them. They're, they're mainly around either the function is too complex, like it's too large, or it, there are unhandled operations. There are some constructs which the Go team don't know how to rewrite from a function into its caller. It could get very complicated. And so we can see that um, byte readers extend function can't, can't do. It's far too complex, but that's okay because it's not in the hot path. And also scanner.token can't be inlined because, uh, because it's, too it's too complex. So if you ref recall back to the constraints where I said there are things we want to minimize and there are operations we want to do hopefully per token, not per byte, scanner.next is called for each token in the input. That means the token, that means scanner.token is called for each input, token in the input. Now token can't be inlined automatically because it's too complicated. And so therefore we're going to pay two function calls per token. Now I'm just going to do, uh, again, what Kirill advised us not to do, which is don't make your code uglier for the sake of performance. But when you see the numbers, perhaps you'll think it's justified. This is the same scanner.next function rewritten to basically bring the white space check in line. It's quite long, I won't go through it all. But the results support the thesis that making two function calls, we should only make one, was costing us time. You can see we've improved the, the throughput 9% uh, to nearly 25%. And the largest input comes in Canada, the one that basically showed no, no improvement previously. And the reason for this is because Canada contains no white space and the job of the token function is to filter out white space and then return back, every time we called scanner.next, that would call scanner.token to align it scanner.token would immediately find that there's nothing to do and return. So we're paying the overhead of that function call going through the loop no times and returning straight away. Just to recap before we move on, um, updates to the op that offset field, they can't be registerized, so the CPU has to write it back on every iteration. Um, and that kind of goes to like CPU internal mechanic, buffering, write back buffer kind of things. But it's work that doesn't need to be done, and we can find a, we can find a way to avoid it. We saw that scanner.next and token were effectively one function written in kind of a clean code style, but, which required them to be spread over two. Um, they were too big to be inlined, and so we paid that extra function call. And doing the work manually to inline them made the code harder to read. It is now kind of this big kind of kernel function but delivered substantial improvements. And the most bizarre thing about this is that most JSON contains white space. Um, it's usually optimized for human readability. You pass it through, through JQ if it's not. And it turns out the more white space it is, the faster this package decodes. Um, the the CTM package is now, the CTM input is now 50% of our baseline. The sample is nearly 75. I think it's 
Yeah, nearly 75% of our 2 gig baseline. All right, this is the last step. We've tokenized, and now we have to, we have a stream of tokens. But the tokenization uh, isn't enough, because uh, in, in, in the JSON schema, only certain tokens are valid at certain points. For example, if we have a curly brace, the string username, the only valid token that can follow from that is colon. No, nothing else is valid. It's all, uh, that would be invalid JSON. And so we need, a, we need a, a thing on top of this to kind of run the JSON state machine, to look at the tokens, to look at the current state it's in, and say valid or invalid. Here are some states here. Here's a decoder. It has, a, it has the next token function that we saw very, very early on. And so the first thing it does is it calls scanner.next, gets the next token, we just check if the uh, length of the token is less than one, which is the error condition, which just says enter file. And if not, then the token is valid. And we just do a switch. Say, if we're in state value, then we call the state value method, which does its processing. If we're in state object comma, we call state object comma. If you're interested, you can break down all of these yourselves. And so now we're at this level of being an actual JSON decoder, we can compare ourselves against encoding JSON. And let me just scroll down. So package JSON is what we're talking about today. Encoding JSON is self-evident. And you can see that with this, uh, with our decoder API, we're between eight to 10 times faster. So let's dig into what this D next token is doing and see if we can make any improvements there. In the general case, switch is very convenient to write. Like it's a lovely linguistic construct to be able to say, to make it a, a set of cases. If it's an A, then do A. If it's a B, then do B. But never, never do both kind of thing. Now under the hood, the way that switch is usually implemented is something like this. If state equals state value, then call state value. If state equals state object string, then call that. So we're just doing a linear scan through all the possible values of state, and if not, running off the end. And the problem with this in the, the, the let, me, let me just sidestep a little bit. There's no problem with the if statement. Don't, ever, don't take away from this that I'm saying David said you should not use ifs. What I'm pointing out is that in this central the central kind of uh, kernel of the decoder where we want to eke out as much performance as possible. If statements which represent branches um, put pressure on the CPU's branch predictor. If it predicts the wrong direction and goes down the wrong branch path, uh, it has to stop, flush its pipeline, rewind and take the other branch. And that's very, very expensive. Um, pipelining is the central thing which allows CPUs to operate at gigahertz but it comes with the cost that if you mispredict the branch, you have to undo tens of instructions, go back, start again. This is not just a problem for JSON decoding. It shows up everywhere. You would have seen three other switch statements higher up in this package. They show up everywhere. Um, the canonical one is like doing a bytecode interpreter where you have bytecode and you're switching to, you're going to switch on that for the method that you want. So there are many classical optimizations for this. The first one would be, let's make a table. We have a set of enumerations, which are the, all the states we can be in. So let's make a table from state object to the actual method we call, the colon to the method we call. And then we could write something like this, which we get the token, we check it's valid, and then we look up in the state table for the current state that we're in, get the method, and dispatch that token to it. Now, sadly, this doesn't compile because there's uh, an initialization loop. We're using the identifiers before we've defined them. And it, 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 it could be possible to work around this, but it turns out there's a better way to do this. I'm not sure if this is the, the name name, but I, I definitely have heard it referred to as this. It's called a computed go-to. Because if we look at that table, 
we can see that there's, there's a one-to-one -one relationship between the state that we want, the state that we're in, and the method that we want to call. And so state is storing a proxy for the method, but to call that method, we then have to do a switch to find the appropriate, to find the appropriate method. Wouldn't it just be easier if we could just store the method that we wanted to call right there in the state value, rather than this other proxy for it, which we then had to go and do a lookup? And of, of course, with all this setup, it is absolutely possible to do this using some extremely old Go magic called method expressions, which no one ever uses anymore because we have now function literals. So this is what we end up with. State is now a function to call. We get, uh, every time we call next token, we get a token from the scanner, we check it's valid, and then we call state and we pass in the token. I do have to speed it up here. No change. But this does optimize some, some further optimizations. If we look again at what we're seeing here, we get the token, we check it's valid, we pass it into the current state method. And what I'm going to show you now is by pushing that is token valid, getting the token and checking if it's valid, pushing it down into the actual state method we call, we've reduced next token to just that. Every time we call next token, we call the method for the state that we're in, that's it. We don't pass anything in, we don't pass the token in. And you might be saying, well, you just made the code uglier again. You just took those four lines which were nicely refactored and dry in next token and you pushed them down to each of the callers. And again, there's a reason for this. The first one is not passing that token into the state method saves us three words on the call stack. A byte slice is three words. But more importantly, by moving that len check down into the function here, the compiler now knows if we get to this line, then the, the number of tokens, in the length of token must be one or more. So we know that this zero, so the zeroth element is known to be valid because we just did the check to make sure it is just above. This is called bounds check elimination. Um, just showing you there that the compiler is now able to prove that, that getting token of zero is, is now uh, in bounds. And the final thing that this unlocks is now next token becomes small enough that it itself can be inlined. And so we might write something like this in our code. Well, this is what the compiler sees because next token is being completely optimized away. So even though we can't write this as a caller, we can structure the code in such a way that this is what the compiler sees. And again, we eliminate one function call per token. So, bring it all together. At the lowest level, we can tokenize JSON uh, without allocation in a streaming fashion for inputs until the end of the universe. And we never take any allocation. At the next level, wrapping all these improvements up, it's about two to three times faster than the equivalent JSON. And this is using uh, decoder.token. So we re-implemented the allocating API that encoding JSON exposes on top of our uh, decode token, ne our next token API, and we're still three times faster. Mainly through considerably less allocations. And if you're prepared to accept um, the slightly less conventional API, you can go up to 10 times faster. Using, next, using the next token API. And if we wrap this all up and you're trying to do, use not just decode token but unmarshal into an object, it tends to be around uh, one to one and a half times faster, all said. JSON is still an incredibly allocation heavy um, process and even though we can optimize the underlying steps of that, fundamentally if you're filling out an object, uh, a Go structure from data you receive over the wire, you have to allocate 
for that, and there's no real way around that. Okay, my time is up. Allocations affect performance. Hopefully everyone has drilled that in. We want to eliminate them through API design. Most of the speedups come from reducing those allocations. Time not spent allocating is time not spent messing around in the heap allocation path, but it's time spent, it's time now available for you to do processing rather than bookkeeping. Your design of your API influences performance. If you have an API which requires allocations to be taken, at some point, no matter how much you optimize that, you're eventually benchmarking the garbage collector. If your function requires allocations or forces allocations onto the caller, eventually you're just going to end up benchmarking how quickly you can allocate. And the last one is think about how I transformed the overheads that we did have to take from per byte to per token. We don't have to call a function for each byte because we have the window which returns us a large slice. We, a lot of the work is amortized into working per token rather per function. And if you think about some of the JSON you interact with, it, a lot of it is medium to long streams. So those tokens are actually quite substantial. And that's it. Thank you, thank you to the, all the organizers, to Valentine, to Sam, to all the organizers for having us here today. Um, links to the presentation, links to the code as well. I'll scroll down just a tad so you can get that. Um, I have well and truly used up my time here, but you're welcome to buttonhole me at lunch or the rest of the day. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dave. Okay, so I think we do have questions coming in, but because of the time limitation, maybe you can come up to Dave personally and speak. Yeah, speak to him personally, speak to any of the speakers.